be faithful to the calling that God's given all of us. And because one of the things that we know is we can't all do all things, can we? But we can uh, support the work of uh, individuals and organizations all over our state, especially our sister churches like uh, First Baptist Bainbridge, who are part of that ministry there. And we want to be faithful to do our part and then to do our local part right where we are and opportunities that are around us, taking every single one and moving forward and walking through those open doors. That's important for us. So thank you for giving and thank you for what you will give as we uh, come to the uh, end of this month. We hope that uh, we've met our goal and beyond. So we want to just be faithful in that in every way. Hope you've had a good afternoon. Thank you for being here tonight. And as we've uh, come together to worship the Lord, I want to finish up a series of messages that have been from the book of Genesis about uh, uh, the, the uh, man Joseph and whom I've called a man of God's character because he was uh, a person that opened his mind, his heart, to the direction of the Lord no matter what was going on and the circumstances that surrounded him. And so all of us have different circumstances. All of us face challenges every day. Our lives are going to be different, but a lot of the challenges are going to be the same. And we have to decide in our spirit and our heart, are we going to be faithful to what we know the Lord has called us to do and to be, and recognize he has a big plan, a big purpose for every one of us in this room. I don't know if you believe that or not, but you ought to. God has that plan and purpose for every single life, and we need to uh, be seeking that purpose in the power of God's Spirit every day, because he wants to reveal it to us. And You're an encourager, you're a blessing to someone as a believer until the last breath you take here on the earth. So every day we have an opportunity to meet the challenges that come in life and also to be a blessing to those around us that we face. So uh, God used Joseph in a mighty way. Now you, from from the beginning of us looking at Joseph's life, you, you saw how God gave him dreams. You saw how the Lord uh, prepared him uh, in many ways in his home life for what he was going to experience later on because he had a basic faith and trust in the Lord God that seemed to be unwavering. And God's spirit and blessing was upon him no matter what situation or circumstance he faced, whether he is, uh, was hated by his brothers and Uh, ridiculed by them, and then eventually uh, uh, sold into slavery by them uh, to the time that he spent in prison. And we left him last week. He's still in prison, right? He'd interpreted the butler's dreams and the baker's dream, uh, and he asked the butler when he he got uh, back close to the the king, to Pharaoh of Egypt, uh, that he would remember him. And then we read just a few verses before the close last week that uh, the chief butler did not remember Joseph but forgot him. Sometimes we feel forgotten, don't we? We feel like uh, people have cast us aside and we even think maybe God's cast me aside. But he never does. And he always has that purpose and plan for us. We've just got to hold on and recognize a turning point is going to come. Now, that's what we're going to conclude with tonight. This is not, obviously, the end of Joseph's story in the book of Genesis, and I'd encourage you to read on about the reconciliation of Joseph and his brothers and the way that God used that whole experience of Joseph's life to be a testimony and a model to us because Joseph lived to be 110 years old. And the Bible tells us that he was as vital at 110 as he was in his younger years and that he saw uh, the fourth generation of his uh, children uh, be a part of his life. So what an amazing legacy. But that first 30 years was a tough go, wasn't it? Until he became 30 years old and he was elevated to the place of prominence in Egypt, he went through some difficult battles. But yet, 
He always had that unwavering faith and part of the character of God that he exhibited and lived out every single day. But he, just like all of us, have turning points in our lives. And those turning points are vital for us to remember and important for us to take those memories with us to remind us all the time God is going to be faithful. Always. We're going to read scripture tonight again from Genesis uh, and we're in Genesis 41 and we're going to look at verses 37 through 39. Genesis 41 verses 37 through 39. Before we get there let me just remind you as I, I just started to a moment ago the chief butler forgot Joseph in verse 23 of chapter 40 and then that first verse of chapter 41 it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream and behold he stood by the river and of course the dream was that there were seven really fat healthy cows that came out of the river and then there were seven very gaunt sickly cows that came uh, out of the river and the seven gaunt sickly cows ate up the seven healthy uh, well-fed cows and then he had an, another dream and the other dream was about uh, wheat stalks and how there were some healthy good-looking ones and then there were some uh, ones that had been blighted by the east wind and they looked terrible but the the ones that looked terrible devoured uh, and consumed the ones that were healthy and Pharaoh woke up and he couldn't figure out what are these dreams about and then in the process of things all of his advisors all of his magicians all of his uh, soothsayers couldn't come up with, with what was going on with Pharaoh's dreams and Pharaoh was angry about the whole situation and then the chief butler remembered and the Bible tells us in verse number nine that the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying I remember my faults this day and he went on to explain how Joseph in the prison interpreted his dream and the baker's dream and everything Joseph interpreted happened exactly the way he said and so from that point on Pharaoh was intrigued he called for Joseph to come out of the prison the Bible says, Joseph, uh, you can imagine what condition he was in when he came, when he was, came from the prison. It says they, he, he shaved himself, he put on clean and everything to go before the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh told Joseph his dreams. And, and Joseph told the Pharaoh, it's God who interprets dreams. It's always good to give credit where credit's due, right? God is the one who reveals dreams. God's the one who plans our life. God's the one who knows what we need before we ask. God's the one that we count on at all times at every place. And so Joseph attributes all glory and honor to God and tells Pharaoh, it's my God that's going to give the interpretation of this dream. And he says in verse 28, in following so I can prepare us to read these scripture verses this is the thing which I've spoken to Pharaoh God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do indeed seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt but after them seven years of famine will arise and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will deplete the land so the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land may not perish during 
the famine. So in every way, God uses Joseph to uh, interpret these dreams and to give Pharaoh exactly what he needed to know in order to proceed for the future. Now we're going to read these verses 37 through 39 together. Would you stand with me and let's respect God's word and read the verses and allow God to speak to us. Let's begin. Verse 37, let's say it together. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Father, speak to us tonight and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So Joseph, who had been chosen to be the heir and leader of his clan, was taken and stripped of his robe of leadership, thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, endured the humiliation of being a slave, but allowing God's uh, spirit to bless him, use him to be uh, good at what he did, uh, be faithful to his master, be a person that his master could trust with all things. And even though the world and Satan himself and all of his evil striving to pull Joseph uh, into uh, disrepair and another pit called the prison of the king by taking Mrs. Potiphar and using her as an instrument of lying and deceit to destroy Joseph's reputation, to destroy his life and livelihood and throw him into prison. But then God again blesses him pours his spirit out upon him. It's recognized throughout uh, all the prison, and the keeper of the prison puts him in charge of everything. And even when Pharaoh becomes angry with two of his servants and casts them into the prison, the keeper of the prison puts Joseph in charge of them in particular. And in that situation, in the God's perfect timing, he uses Joseph to interpret dreams that one day, we find out two years later, finally gets Joseph to the place where he's in, placed in position before the king in front of Pharaoh himself. I would say that's a real turning point in life, wouldn't you? We all have turning points. Wouldn't it be great if we had a sign that was right in front of us that said, turning point straight ahead, just ahead. You can count on there's going to be a turning point in your life. You may be going through even something tonight. All of us have had turning points. I remember uh, 17 years old going to my dad and telling him, uh, Dad, I really feel like God's called me into ministry. And my dad looked at me at the kitchen table that night, I'll never forget. And he, he said, now and you have to understand, my dad was the pastor's best friend. So he, he knew about uh, what it meant to be in ministry. He was a, a deacon, servant leader. Uh, he uh, and mom were uh, in church all the time and leadership in the church our whole lives. He looked at me and said, son, you know, you'll never make any money, right? And I said, daddy, I understand that. I said, that's not, that, that's not, I, I said at the time, that's not important to me. Well, you find out later on when you pay the bills, it can be important, Right? But, you know, you, you recognize if God's called you to something, God will provide for what you need. And he always has. Testimony a thousand times over, he's provided for everything that Julie and I have ever needed. So we praise the Lord for that. But my dad was serious. You know you'll never make any money. And you know how difficult it is to do what you're thinking God wants you to do? He just wanted to make sure that I had thought through in my little 17-year-old mind what it meant to make this commitment and to follow this calling. That was a turning point in my life. It was a turning point in my life when I asked Julie to marry me. And even more important that she said yes, that she would marry me. And so uh, that was a turning point in my life. It was a turning point 
when we had our children. And we recognized God had gifted us and blessed us with uh, treasures that we call our children and that we were, uh, they still belong to him, but we were called to be good stewards of our children. So, an important, but the biggest turning point in my life happened long, long before all those. When I was eight years old and I understood that I needed Jesus. And I asked Christ to come into my heart and my life and understood in my little eight-year-old mind what that meant in that moment. I didn't understand everything about Christianity. I didn't understand everything about faith about what it meant to trust God in every situation all the time. I just knew he loved me and his son died on the cross for my sins. And I knew that as he rose again on the third day, he did that to give me life so I could live with him forever. And that's all I needed to know. The turning points in our lives As believers begin that moment, we come to know Christ as our Savior. And from that point on, we see how God wants to give us purpose, give us a plan, give us direction, give us what we need every moment that we need it. But we have to put our trust in Him and realize that when these turning points happen in our lives, it's not going to be the last one. This won't be the last one for Joseph, but it'll be a big one, wouldn't you say? The turning point that the butler remembered. So that's where it started, this turning point for Joseph. It started when divine remembrance came through Pharaoh's, the king's butler, the chief butler. He remembered, and he, he told Pharaoh, even in his presence, he said in verse number 9 of Chapter 41, the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. I remember that I didn't tell you about Joseph. And then he tells about Joseph and he fulfills his responsibility at when? The perfect time. You know, God has a perfect time for everything. And sometimes we think, God, why are you so slow in this? I've been praying about this for years. But it's in God's perfect timing that things take place. And we have to put our trust in the perfect timing of God. God calls the butler to remember his blessing at just the right time. God gives us divine appointments at just the right time. And and we need to recognize those in our everyday life. You know, uh, you may run across somebody who has a need. And as you run across somebody who has a need, that may become a divine point, appointment for you and also for that person who has the need. And so when that divine appointment's there, you have an opportunity to not only share to meet their physical need, but you may be used by God to meet their spiritual need. That's the reason we talked about, we've talked about those bags of blessing uh, to take out among people in our community. We realize it's not just about giving them some physical stuff to help them along the way for a week or two. It's about us praying with them. It's about us uh, interjecting our lives into their lives and letting them know there is somebody who loves you. There is somebody who cares about you. And that's our opportunity our divine appointment that God gives me, the chief butler realized, wow, uh, it's just the the right time to talk to the king about uh, what happened to me, how how Joseph interacted with my life, how I had a divine appointment. It's an amazing thing to me, and I all the way through this study, how God works through and speaks to pagan rulers. God can use any person in any ruler in any king in any kingdom at any moment anytime he wishes and he he does it all the time and we don't even recognize it but here in this passage we see it over and over and over again and pharaoh is so impressed with what has been said to him because what happened joseph didn't just interpret a dream 
he gave Pharaoh, the king, a plan to, to make sure that things were going to be okay in the land of Egypt. And so he wasn't just, okay, this is the interpretation of your dream, now have a good day. It was, this is what God says and how you can be successful. And that's how God works in our lives. He doesn't just throw us out there an explanation. He shows us how we can live our lives in his blessing. And that's exactly what he used Joseph to let him know. I, I would have loved to have been alive and have seen the process whereby Joseph became second in command of all of Egypt, took control and authority over all of this work, and seen the impact it had on the Pharaoh and his family. You know, because we look at the fact, here, Joseph has this long life. He's not just a blip in history. He lives 110 years. And he lives all of the, many of those years right there in Egypt being the influence upon a culture. This was in the 12th dynasty. This was the most powerful era that Egypt ever had. And whose hand was upon it? The Lord God's hand was upon it. And that's why it was so powerful. And so we, we see how this divine remembrance through the butler gives this divine appointment and how God works in just the perfect time in our lives and that's what he does in our life he works perfectly and we need to believe that and live in that second thing is god-given directions were placed in joseph's spirit only god can interpret dreams joseph said that right out of his mouth only god can do this i can't do it god does it through me so god interprets dreams and joseph knew that the Lord would reveal the dream to him that Pharaoh had. It was a time to glorify the one true God. And I'm always amazed, uh, again, at Pharaoh's response. It, can we find such a one as this, verse 38, a man in whom is the capital S, Spirit of God. And this is coming, remember, this is coming from a guy who... He was going to, he as an Egyptian worshipped a pantheon of gods, many gods. But now he identifies and recognizes the spirit of the one true God. It happened later on in the Old Testament when you see a man like Nebuchadnezzar who's overcome with the spirit of God and how he recognized, even though he was a worshiper of many false gods, he recognized the one true God of all creation. And that's how God works through our lives to minister to and to love others in, in that very same way. The turning points in our lives are testimonies to others. They're testimonies for us to remember and memories for us to have that we can live every single day knowing God has given me turning points in my lives, times where I've seen his hand at work in me. And he uses those to be instructions and helps to people around us as we're able to share what God's done in our life and testify what he's done. It was a time to glorify the one true God. How did Joseph know what to say or to do unless it was God? Joseph had never been a food manager. But all of a sudden, God put him in the position that you're going to manage everybody's food for the next 14 years. You know, your job, Pharaoh said, is to complete this plan that you've developed. You're the wisest of anybody we've ever found. So you do it. And Joseph, <coughs> with, with no knowledge and had no schooling of being a food planner, but God gave him exactly what to do, and they created almost entire cities that stored food. Amazing. And, and did it over that seven years of time. And the scripture goes on to tell us the amazing part of how Joseph was elevated in this, this turning point to his place and position in Egypt. 
And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Verse 41. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. Now, that's a big deal. Because if you were the king and you had a, a, a signet ring that you wore, of course, as being the king, anyone you gave it to, anyone that had your crest on it, had your authority. You were a part of the family. Here was a slave, a prisoner, a Hebrew from Canaan that had been elevated to now you're a part of Pharaoh's family. So he put the signet ring on his hand and then it says he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck, another sign of authority in the land. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaph, uh, Zaphnath Paneah. And he gave him a wife, Azaneth, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh, and he went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, meaning he had uh, authority over everything. And so there he went, doing what God had planned and prepared and purposed for him to do. And he went throughout the land of Egypt, and he followed Whose directions? His vision? His direction? No. He followed God's direction, God's vision, God's purpose. Everything that Joseph had had been placed in his spirit by the power of God. Now, he leads us to ask a question. For all of us here as God's people, are we coming before the Lord every day saying, Lord, what's on your agenda for me today? I, I don't know about you, but I tend to have a calendar. Whether you put it on your phone, whether you write it down or with your own handwriting, whether you type it out uh, and put it on some paper calendar somewhere, we all tend to have a calendar. What's on our agenda today? What's going on today? Where do I have to be today? Where, you know, what's, my, what's my life going to consist of today? Do we ever say... God, I know what I've got on my calendar today, but what do you have for me today? What's, what's your direction over my life today? What would you have me to do today? I found out a long time ago as a pastor that no matter what I had on my calendar for the day, that by the time I drove from my house to the church office, it was going to change. Almost every time. And you, you, you come back to realize God always has a plan and purpose, and he brings things into your day and into your life that you might not have expected, but you can expect, because God has that purpose for you. So consulting his agenda is one of the most important things we ever do in life. I look at Joseph's life, and I say, isn't that amazing? He went, in one day, he went from being a prisoner in the dungeon to out to be the viceroy of Egypt, the second in command. And Pharaoh says, who could have the Spirit of God as greatly upon him as Joseph had? And he elevates him to that place where he's a part of his family. He gives him a wife and a, uh, a, a title and a situation and a purpose. And Joseph goes about the business of what God had called him to do. Verse 47 and following says, Now in the seven plentiful years the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities and laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. It says, Joseph gathered much, very much grain at, as the sand of the sea and still until he stopped counting for it was immeasurable. You know, that's how God does it. He immeasurably gives us 
more than we could ever ask or think. And that's what he did in Joseph's life and for Egypt. But he got everything ready for the seven years of famine that was going to be devastating upon the land and devastating upon every country. And even Egypt, it says the people were crying out because they were hungry, but guess what? They had a plan because God gave them the plan. And God gave them the plan and everybody could be filled and buy grain uh, from uh, Joseph and the, the leaders in Egypt. And it says, the famine was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, verse 54, there was bread. It's amazing. God gives us what we need at the moment we need it. And he provided everything that was going to be needed in this turning point in Joseph's life and a turning point in the life of Egypt and in the family of the Pharaoh that was there. He was elevated to leadership. Why? Because he made all the right choices and all the right decisions? No. Because he was good all the time? No. Because he had a godly character that said, I believe no matter what. I, there, there are times that I know we all struggle with our unbelief, don't we? Do you struggle with that? I do. We struggle with moments we say, I, I don't know what to believe. But then we come back to what? Our foundation. And our foundation is that God loves us and he sent his son in the world for us. And we believe that and we're trusting in that. And we've seen God work all these different times. So we're reminded in our hearts that God is always going to be faithful and Joseph was elevated to leadership because he had that ability to look back and see God is always faithful. God's spirit has always been upon him. I imagine that even though he had those many years afterwards, uh, 80 years, right? 80 and 30 is 110. Is that right? Okay, thank you. I asked Brother Phil, he's the numbers guy. I'm just... So... I can ask Brother Phil, and he knows numbers just like that all the time. Thank you. That's how you figure it out. Okay. So anyway, so the next 80 years, we have Joseph living this extraordinary life, but I can imagine that even in that time period, he had some challenges, wouldn't you think? So, but even in his challenges, God blessed him. His biggest challenges were uh, when his brothers came to visit, and he had to figure all that out and God blessed him to show him that he didn't need to have uh, a sense of uh, animosity toward his brothers in fact one of the uh, greatest uh, passages I think in the book of Genesis is toward the end right before Joseph it talks about the uh, death of Joseph Uh, it uh, it reminds us in verse 20 of chapter 50 of Genesis But as for you, you meant evil against me. He's talking to his brothers now. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. When his brothers were afraid that when their father Jacob died, Joseph was going to take care of business and just, you know, kill them for what they've done and get back at them for selling them into slavery. He says, what you meant for evil, God turned all around and meant it for good for me. And that's where we have to be in our lives when we look at the power of God and the power of living godly character every day is understanding God is going to be faithful, absolutely believe in him and we can count on him. He may give us a new assignment from time to time, and we'll have these turning points in our lives, but we can always trust, and every time we look back, God was faithful in our life. Joseph saw God's faithfulness even being thrown into a pit and sold into slavery. He even lied and, and, and cheated upon and thrown into prison. Even to the point 
that I'm sure he might have wanted to have words with the chief butler when he got back upstairs, don't you think, from the dungeon. I thought you were going to remember me. But at just the right time, just the, just the right moment, God gave him what he needed and elevated him to leadership and his godly character speaks to us today. Several years ago, I had a meeting at the state capitol in uh, Atlanta. And uh, as I was going, I, had, I was serving as a chaplain a uh, uh, few blocks down the road at a, a big tall building in uh, downtown Atlanta. And so I figured it out that I could walk this distance and it wouldn't, just, it wouldn't be a big deal. You know, you get some big dreams when you think you can walk and you've got, uh, you've got the logistics all down. Well, boy, I didn't think about it clear enough because uh, I started on my uh, little walking journey, and man, it got longer and longer and longer. And then when I finally got close to the state capitol and to the office building I had to go to, I said, that is a long way up there. And I, and I didn't have my uh, terrific sketcher shoes on that I've got tonight that really make my feet feel good. I had these uh, uh, fancy dress shoes on because I, I was dressing to impress that day. So I started going up that hill and going up the steps and thinking, I am never going to make it. And you know, many times spiritually, it takes a lot longer than we expected, and the journey is a lot more rugged than we thought it would. And it comes back to us spiritually that it's trusting in the Lord's strength alone and realizing that the climb that we have is something we're not going to do alone. God's strength is going to be there. Joseph had the strength of God that propelled him forward. He had the strength of God that gave him uh, insight into what was going to happen next. He had the purpose of God and the plan of God prepared for him, and he just needed to follow direction. And when he got discouraged, he could come back to the Lord and recognize, because when he was dealing with his brothers, and I'd encourage you to read that passage when the brothers uh, come and Joseph recognizes them and he does everything in his power to keep himself right, but he is grieving in his spirit. He's having uh, uh, the, the book of Genesis PTSD right there when the brothers show up. That's exactly what happened to him. And when he was going through that terrible grief, God taught him something. He, he taught him that, listen, I've helped you overcome all these other obstacles. You've had these turning points in your life, and now you're at a point in time where you're not only in a position of blessing because my spirit's been upon you, but you have the position to bless your family. Not to hate your family, not to have animosity toward your family, but to welcome and forgive your family as God would instruct him, as I forgive you, as I include you, as I make you part of my family, you make them a part of your family. And that's what he did. And he reminded them right there at the end in Genesis 50 that even though they had the, all the wrong intentions of hating him and throwing him in a pit and selling him into slavery, God's intention was to use all of that to do what? To save his whole family. And saved his family so that, because who was this family? The chosen ones of God. And even though they would go through a time of slavery in Egypt, what would God do? He would send the deliverer to lead them out. Because God is ever, ever, ever faithful. Father, thank you for blessing us and thank you for Joseph's life. And for what it means to read about him and how you worked and established a godly character within his spirit. So that he knew without a doubt that you were there no matter what. Whether in the pit, whether in slavery, whether in prison, whether in the king's house. He knew your power over his life. 
and we thank you for that. We thank you that he was able to see the generations of his children when, when they were born to uh, see the blessing of that to the fourth generation. That he, when he had Manasseh and Ephraim, his children, he named them so that Manasseh would remind him that he could forget the bitterness that he would have toward his family for what they've done. And Ephraim would remind him that he was fruitful in the land. And we're thankful, God, for all the ways that remind us of your power, your strength, and your blessing upon us every day. Help us go out into our lives, go out into our world. And even, Lord, when the journey seems tough and winding and we didn't expect it to be as long as it is, and sometimes we're going through uh, grief and hurt and turmoil, yet you are always going to be walking with us and giving us the grace and the challenge to meet the need. And we thank you, Lord, for that. May you be high and lifted up in us, and thank you for the week you're about to give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.